welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And notice how I did not say the danger zone. Uh, it turns out the danger zone was too good of a name. I should have known this. It's too perfect, too spot on. Uh, it turns out that there are several other podcasts uh, named Danger Zone. One of them happens to be owned by the one and only Motor City Madman, Ted Nugent. And I don't want any problems with Ted Nugent. Yeah, so we, I tossed around a few other names and uh, I think the best one that works is the Danger Cast. So from now on, we'll be changing the name to the Danger Cast and that's uh, what we refer, refer to it as. Now, I have a very special guest with me today but before I introduce him, I just want to uh, talk about Danger Zone, Danger, <laughs> Danger Fest, uh, a little bit. Um, now I want to do a whole another episode about Danger Fest, but I, I want to have a couple friends that were uh, that were there with me so we can talk back and forth. Um, Danger Danger Fest was a huge success. We had eighty six throwers from all over the country. We had well over a hundred people there. Um, it was an amazing week, amazing weekend, super, it ran really, really smooth, even though that was, that was a lot of people to, to have to deal with. Uh, but every year we learn and, uh, it, every year it gets smoother. So, um, hopefully the next episode that we do, uh, will be all about danger fest and I can get some friends down here to, to help me with that because it was an amazing, amazing weekend and. I, I, I can't say it enough. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what the next episode is going to be. But today with me, I have Ace Johnson from Delta to Alpha, flew down from Canada to hang out with me for the weekend. And uh, we've been uh, hanging out, throwing knives. He's been drinking energy drinks and eating beef jerky all weekend. I've been, you know, drinking my PBRs. So thanks for coming on, Ace. And uh, Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> your, yeah. uh, your energy drinks are just a wee bit stronger down here. I just want you to know that. Yeah, he's been killing energy drinks, man. So, yeah, we've been having a lot of fun. The first night we just, uh, well, we just threw knives. For how long did we throw? I think five hours, six hours. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that, was, that was great, man. Getting to know each other. You know, we've been talking. How long have we been... We've been talking since what was it April? We started talking. Probably yeah. It was right around. It was right around when we launched the J seven. Okay. Uh, and I sent one down to you, and you're like, "I hate this." And then I was like, "Send me a video why." And then you kept <laughs> sticking it when you were trying to not stick it. So anytime someone sends me a knife, it, I'm I greatly appreciate it, and I I try to do uh, uh, a review video and say what I do and don't like and. You know, the knife that you sent me was complete opposite of what I was used to. It was a tip, tip heavy knife with a kind of a skeletonized handle. And it was just, I had a rough time with it, but yes, you were right. He was, he asked me to send him a video of me throwing it. And when I did, I stuck it every time for multiple distances too. And, uh, so from there he started asking me what would I do to change the knife design and what do I like best? So um, I was trying to get my knives made through another maker. It fell through a couple different times and uh, Ace stepped up and said, let's let's make it happen. So appreciate that, man. Uh, it's just fun to see somebody's passion come to life and be a part of that. And I mean, the world's full of good ideas that aren't mine. Yeah, well, I've, I really appreciate it, man. And um, I've talked to and met a lot of people um, from the internet, you know, through knife throwing and social media and, you know, most, most everybody's been pretty, pretty cool, but there's a lot of people that you meet online and have conversations with that you haven't met in person. And they say that they're going to be doing, they say that you're going to do a lot of things and they, not a lot of them follow through and you have followed through plus some. And, uh, I really appreciate that, man. I appreciate the help. Well, there's that there's that old saying, right? Right. Everyone's a gangster un, un, until un, until a real gangster shows up. Gangster right? shit. Uh, I had this boss when I was young, first boss, and uh, he was a bit of a character. And he said, you know, he's never much of a dancer, but wait till the fucking begins. And so <laughs> for me, my attitude has always been 
punter promise over the liver. And so with your knives, like, okay, let's talk about what do you want? Show me design. I didn't promise that much, but just like, okay, my goal from the time I talked to you is I need to get some within your hand, in your hand within five weeks. Yeah. And you did. Right. And so it was going through, there was a little bit of like making throwing knives. Like we've been, we've been involved in manufacture of lots of knives, but like a folding knife, you can use a lot of different stuff. Right. So we did the H2C. It was the first nice that knife that we produced is folder, right? You don't throw folders. So we were using an N690 CO with a Rockwell hardness, like an HRC, like 58. Pretty hard. Great for a utility knife. Sure. Right. You go through and try to put a 58 on an N690 CO a straight blade and you throw it, that thing would be better, better have a real good geometry. It's got any weak spots, any hard corners. Yeah. You're gonna like you're after, gonna after a, any weaknesses, huh? You'll get 50 to 250 throws and shit's gonna snap. Yeah. And so for me, it was I like taking on projects like this because I get to help you kind of like this is your jam. Yeah. And so I get to learn a whole bunch, but it's also I have to learn a whole bunch about metallurgy, right? Okay, well, going through like you can use 1095, but your your heat treatment. Like you're spot on, huh? right? Like Jason Johnson talks about, I was thermal cycle, uh, therm, uh, thermal cycling, right? Multiple times because 1095 to kind of line up as, as off tonight, Martin site getting and not getting too much carbide content, all that. Yeah. Where from a metallurgy standpoint, you can use something that's got like, I uh, got a little more chromium, a little more vanadium, a little more nickel to get that ductility. But if you put too much in, you wind up kind of getting knives that are burring too much. Like you, like some guys complain about the stainless knives, right? So it's just kind of like, where is the the kind of secret sauce? The heavy medium. Yeah. So we we wound up settling on uh, on an eighty CRV. Yeah. So this is the first time that this knife will be shown or has been shown, other than at Dangerfest. But this, I'm sure a lot of you uh, recognize this design. It is the Danger Dashy, just slimmed down. Um, this is eight and a half inches. Ace has been calling it eight and a half inches of danger, which I don't mind. It's, being, it's funny. He's being quite generous with eight and a half. So, um, but the, big, <laughs> the major difference with this knife is the thickness. It is stupid thick, stupid thick. So with this knife design, uh, we didn't really go for like a, a competition knife, you know, per se. I mean, of course, some people probably could throw this well in competition. But this knife is just straight up for destroying shit. It is 280 grams, has a super aggressive point. It's 80 CRV, two? 80 CRV. I think it's just 80 CRV. 80 CRV, sorry. Um, made by Lewis Prince Steel, or Lewis Prince by Prince Steel Knives, at Prince Steel Knives on Instagram. And he makes some of the best throwing knives I've ever seen. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's right up there with the top three makers, in, in, in my opinion. Um, Super great guy, and he took on this uh, project, and this is the very first iteration of the finalized version. They are going to be uh, laser engraved uh, with Delta to Alpha on one side, and uh, either the Full Tang Clan logo, logo or the Danger Fest logo, or some kind of iteration of that. But these, it's 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 crazy. It, yeah. So, like I said, this isn't going to be like a competition knife. You know, we are going to, I think, slim them down and make some other uh, designs as well, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, so going through and looking at our, our like, what the availability of steel was, we could choose between doing, like, so our initial prototypes were in millimeters, so we started with 8 mil. Yeah. Um, in different parts of the world, like when you get outside North America, your steel comes in 4 mil, 5 mil, 6 mil, 7 mil, 8 mil, kind of goes up like that. We're over here, there's this giant gap that goes from, quarter inch up to three eighths. I, had, I didn't even realize that. I didn't really either, right? Um, and so going through and looking at that and based on availabilities of product and stuff like that right now, because some shortages, it's like, okay, do we want to use quarter inch 1095 and do kind of, you know, like a more casual thrower? Sure. Or do we want a full send? <laughs> and and he's, and, and we're ta I'm talking to, talking to Lewis on the phone and he's like, well, we can do three eights, thirty C or uh, eighty CRV, and I was like, "Yeah." 
So yeah, it's it's um, almost indestructible now. I mean, you can't. There's zero chance of breaking this unless you're thrown in the back of another knife, right? Like if you're if maybe you're, maybe yeah. the tip would get deformed, but I don't see it snapping. Oh no, snapping! No, like I think you'll roll the point. Yeah, um, they're real aggressive that way, but we've kind of created with that, like we set out and when I was talking to danger, it's like, okay, well, are we going to go through and just put out another one of the same, or are we going to do something different? So with these, what we really came to was I've kind of dubbed them the Kudakis um, because we have a couple in series. So his, his dashi, or it's a Kiridashi. Kiridashi? Kiridashi is the, what I was going for with the blade shape for sure. So is a Japanese style and mm -hmm. Kudaki in Japanese just means crusher. Like in Bujinkan Ninjutsu, there's a technique called Oni Kudaki, and it means demon crusher. <laughs> Love it. Don't ask. That's what it's called. But so looking at this thing, it's like, okay, it's eight and a half inches, so it's small enough that we can carry it. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's all about like, could I carry it? Sure. Right. Um, the weight is like 260, 280 yep, grams. Sure. So to kind of put that in perspective, it weighs somewhere around twice what a baseball does. And it's a chunk of steel. Baseballs weigh about 140 to 147 grams. I never knew that. I didn't know until I looked it up. Okay. Right. Just before this podcast. <laughs> so we're, we're looking at about twice the weight of a baseball because there's always within the knife throwing community, instinctive throwing combat, right? There's always this kind of like debate. Well, but like, would you throw your knife though? Right? Like, is that going to work? And there's a bunch of reasons to do knife throwing and like, would it work? I mean, let's face it. We all kind of have that like fantasy because we watch Rambo of course, or Predator. Man, that's why I got into the knife throwing. Right. And so it's like, just in case would, would I throw it? Well, <laughs> even if it doesn't hit with the point, a chunk of steel that weighs twice what a baseball does, right? Like, dude, this thing would suck. It's like, well, I mean, regardless, like, like at three meters, do you think that you could pitch a baseball at someone's dome and hit them? Okay, if it connects, is it going to change them? Probably. No. So there's part of that that's like, from a combative standpoint, you could rationalize to yourself in some kind of LARPing role playing thing. Like, you could actually do this. So there's like. You know, you can uh, look at going through and like gambler tosses and gunslinger tosses and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Right? A whole bunch of like fun, like quick draw stuff that you could go through and set up for events. Sure. But it's small enough you can carry it. Uh, it's actually small enough that you could use it as a legit boot knife. Right. You could have a rig built like that. Like who's the who's the guy you're talking to? Met you down at a blade show. Said he's a good old boy. And he was talking about like wanting to make sheaths. And they were like. Burly Man Tactical. Okay. Is the one that was wanting to help me out with making sheaths. Is he on IG? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're a huge uh, Kydex company and they specialize in uh, custom sheaths, but they also have prints, you know, like uh, the, the Full Tang Clan logo. That would be smaller. Cool. And printed up multiple times and it would just be all over the the, the Kydex and totally. whatever you form it around, it just looks cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you get like Cryptek or. Whatever. Oh, it, camo. Crypt Cryptek is probably my favorite glamo. Like, yeah. As a camo, I don't know how well it works, but it sure looks nice. Yeah. You know? He even had some with fucking uh, My Little Pony and unicorns and stuff on it for chicks. Pink. I mean, he had a, a I, whole... I don't know how to break this to you, but like the My Little Pony Kydex is not for chicks. That's well, like... Oh, is that bronies? Oh, yeah. You know what bronies are? Yeah, it's like a whole thing. Oh, cool. That's a whole other podcast. <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. <laughs> All right, so... Like, like getting a chance to kind of chuck these things around, uh, we got, we put them through pumpkins and through like raw chickens and stuff like that. We'll get some videos up for it. Yeah. But it's like, it's fun. It's its own thing. It's small enough you can carry it. It packs enough weight. Like, like they're, they're kind of heavy on the side of like even a competition size knife. Right? It's a little heavier than most people throw a normal size blade. Okay. It, they, they usually go from 200 to 250 grams is like the norm with within about uh, 10 to 10 and a half inches. So okay. this is a little shorter and a little heavier than what most people are, are used to. But there are definitely throwing knives out there that are way heavier than this. Yeah, like I have from Kim Vitale knives out of Russia. Um, I have like the ones that I use like my general whatever for uh, for learning scamp when I'm working with Misha. 
I use a set of Spetz three pros and they're, they're about 10 and a half inches. I think they're, I think they're around 300 grams. Yeah. Hey, Alex, can you bring up Vitaly Kim on uh, Instagram? Vitaly, V-I-T-A-L-Y. I think it's just, I think it's just, or, oh, Kim, I'm sorry. It's excuse Kim me. Knife or Kim, something? Kim Knife. Kim Knife or Kim Knives. So maybe we can, uh, we can find that, that model and check it out. Yeah, it's, it's a very classic, like symmetrical leaf looking design and slightly offset. Um, yeah, keep scrolling down if you don't mind. That's yeah, definitely his stuff. Um, so it's not because thrown that's, stuff. how did you spell it, man? Oh, sorry. Oh, it, sorry. At, it'll be his account at Kim knives. Uh, go back. Uh, n just, just, uh, just put Kim, not, uh, I think it's Kim knife. Yeah. That yellow square. Yeah. There Perfect. it is. Cool. Yeah. So that Spets three, yeah, the Spets three pro, this is the one that I use is like, yeah, those are my, rad. I, I would say like, like for someone starting out, that would be what I would recommend starting because I can throw those anyway. Uh, it's it's a good knife. They donated a few uh, knives to Danger Fest in 2019, and I had my hands on one of those for a while. And yeah. uh, they're they're a good knife. The only thing I don't are those are those stainless? Yeah, they are. Yeah, I I just don't. For me personally, the stainless seems to. Um, oh, it's 440A. Huh. Very yeah, like it's it's an analog. Okay. It's like it's very close to 440. To me, they just burr easier than than carbon steel, and it's a personal preference. Those knives are not expensive though. Fifty dollars that is very very cheap, and those knives come all the way from Russia. Yeah. So the the biggest issue with that is like like holding them back is is not their price. It's it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get people to wait. Like when I order my set, it's like two months. Yeah, that's it's two a long months. Time. Shipping was expensive, and so yeah, and they they have a few other other models. Those that are, are rad. The way these ones have a blood groove. Hey, no, it's not. You get get stabbed over calling it a blood groove. It's a fuller. <laughs> it makes whistling noises. <laughs> People just freak out when you call it a blood groove. Really? In the knife community. Oh yeah, dude. You never heard that. It's a fuller. It's a blood groove is like a made up thing with, for the fucking movies and shit. It's so when you stab it in somebody, it get, releases easier and you can pull it back out. It's oh. bullshit. I always love anyway. when statements are like are made like that. And the people talking about like, oh, it's so like it like breaks the suction. It's usually by people that have not stabbed people. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. How many people have you been in a conversation with that actually stabbed people? though? Uh, most people have not been a gun like have not stabbed people. <laughs> right um and his other stuff's real good so to kind of help he's got some wild designs it's, it's cool de it's definitely got its own niche it's different so to help out kim kim knives because the shipping is expensive the shipping is long and like like i'm shipping things from canada into the u.s all the time like whether it's our jeans or whatever yeah and people get like bent into shape over like 10 days for shipping because they're like, oh, they want to order on Monday and they want it there Monday afternoon. All right. Because thank you, Amazon, Amazon. Prime. Yeah. Right. So we've kind of partnered up with them and we'll be looking after, after their distri uh, distribution for North America for all their throwing knives. That's awesome, man. It's cool. And they're also just really good people. So yeah. like we're bringing in, bringing in 10 of each of their design and then the Tanto Gata. We're bringing yeah. in 20 of, which kind of has a very, like, tent. It looks... American Tanto. It looks very similar to a version of the Sabretooth with no scales. Yeah. It's all one piece. It's kind of yeah. cool. Like, it's it's definitely got its own flavor. Um, and that's, like, J Jason's got his own style. Absolutely. Um, but this has, like, a like a similarity to it. Bringing in, I think, 20 of those, and we're bringing in 20 of the, uh, the Spets 3 Pros, just because... Well, like, those are going to go quick. Well, I've, like I've been working with working with Misha 
I, I, uh, I can't say Mikhail's last name. Um, I'm just terrible at it. Yeah, I can't either. Um, but, uh, and learning scam, f- uh, scam from him, which is hilarious because there isn't, like, it's basically show and tell. And when I make mistakes, I get videos of him yelling at me, <laughs> telling me this is you and this hilarious gesture, exaggerating what I'm doing. And then, no, right? It's no. like, it's, it's absolutely a fascinating experience. But you also learn like you don't actually need to be able to speak to teach something or to be able to be taught. And like hanging out in boxing gyms in Mexico and like different places, like going going to do CrossFit and yoga, like you can just kind of watch and sh- show and tell, right? Like in Spanish, like hazlo así, I do it like this, así, or no, 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 así, right? No, 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 like this, right? And it's surprising how much you can learn from that. So I'm kind of used to working with that, but the knife he recommended two knives and the spets three pro from kim vitale i can throw a reverse grip backhand reverse grip forehand uh, underhand uh like my my gunslinger throw i call it a gambler's toss works well that way um it flies really well half spin half spin backhand it's just it's just all around a good thrower and it's real classic design um i got a spets five from them and i find it like it's got that you and i were talking about it's got that head on it that really cleaves in yeah so like my half spin with that just lots and lots of fun that's an interesting design yeah so that's the spets five okay it is right um and so similar to the scamp knife very similar except doesn't have the machine work on it. sure yeah so with the with that one because it's got that head when you go through and drop and fire it it really cleaves in and like for me that seems to make a difference you don't seem to think it makes a difference but i'll tell you like it's not that point like trying to throw it no spin and stick it it doesn't like i'm not as good as some obviously but i find that for a half spin with that or like when it's rotating really drives in well i just find what we were talking about before is whenever i throw half spin if you're throwing it blade down it usually lands blade up so you know it's it's kind of unpredictable is how it doesn't like a rotational throw. It's always this way, you know, with a, a no spin or a half spin throw, you're slightly brushing along the edge and it tends to put a little bit of bullet spin on it. So it's unpredictable how it's going to cleave in. So how are you like when I'm doing my half spin rightly or wrongly, I go through and I'm using like a pinch grip like this. And so I bring it back and I fire okay, through. So that would be much more consistent with yeah. it cleaving in the way I do it and most people do. Normal is, people. Well, sure. you know, you've you've done pretty well, but I think that you would have very big problems any, anything past uh, four and a half, five meters and beyond with that grip. I, I just, haven't pushed it past five meters. Yeah. So I yeah. just think that you need your finger okay. on the edge. Okay. And uh, what you, I mean, but what you're talking about is very similar to a military half spin. So okay. I do believe that you could but you would have to learn how to slide more to cancel the spin on that throw. Yeah, he's got some wild designs. Yeah, he does. Um, but so we got them coming in, and then we'll... Uh, Are you going to talk about the the other things you got coming in? Oh, eventually. Um, Are you so, not talking about it now? Secret? Well, we're, we're like going to get oh, there, man. Right? Yeah, so, so he's got something else coming in from we're, we're looking at, Russia, and it's going to be We're looking sick. at Kim, right? So... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start by bringing in all their throwing knives and because in Russia knife throwing is a sport with the same popularity as like basketball pool. is it basketball I don't know man I, mean, I, it's I would popular. I would say like pool or bowling like it's one of those things oh, where okay, one in ten mean. people probably do it with some level of interest like have something set up yeah um, just like how many people have a pool table in their basement here like it's something that people one do right probably Mm -hmm. right so it's one of those things where it's a recognized sport in russia so they kind of have their metallurgy and stuff like that down they have a lot of their designs down but they also are designs that are fairly so this one right here bottom left uh, um bottom left that's the tanta tanto gata it's pretty cool um the blade shape is very very similar yeah. yeah, like it's it's definitely that tantoid. Yeah, American tanto. Is Jason's flat, straight flat across the back, or does it taper in like the CRKT? It's flat, straight shot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
one piece does have scales that'll it'll, it'll break off. The difference is they use a throwing knife edge where Jason's looks like it comes like it's a sharp, sharp. like you could shave with it. You can't sharp, yeah. All right. Um, so going through and looking at why are we bringing in something from Russia? Well, they're hard to get here, right? Be it's very popular right now. But they work, right? Yeah. Like their metallurgy's in, it's a sport, it's recognized, they have a lot of kind of designs, and there's a lot of different designs. So we're gonna go through and be carrying his stuff. And we're the only company, we're the only company outside of Russia that's distributing his knives. And in Russia, it's only Kim Vitaly that offers them. Uh, and then for uh, my coach, Misha, who's probably the most prolific teacher of scamp, would that be fair? I think so. Because um, I don't think, I mean, Olga is obviously huge, but I just don't think that she teaches. I don't know any, like, like I haven't I heard of Olga teaching anyone mm -hmm. online or anything like that. I'm sure she does in person or something, but she doesn't like have an online course like a. She's Mikado. probably like the amount of pop she puts in stuff is wild. Yeah. Like, have you, have you seen any female throwers put that level of pop in? Right. Which is like, bang. Right? No, like, she throws like a guy. She throws like the old man did. She does. Right. It's, it's cool to see. Yeah. Watching those old videos of him and she must have learned at a young age because she transferred over exact. Yeah. yeah. She's a perfect example of scam. So Misha uh, or Mikhail, Misha just means Mike and Mikhail is like Michael. So we'll be helping uh, Misha and, uh, and take care of the distribution for him for kind of North America. And we're also the only company to my knowledge outside of Russia that's gonna be uh, helping to carry the scamp line. And the biggest thing is shipping stuff out of Russia is a pain, it's expensive. It takes a long time because here, when you're exporting things, unless you're dealing with like high tar stuff, um, like whether it's night vision components or certain, like at one time, five axis mills were like regulated right for export because you it's essentially like you put a block in, put in a program and it'll build anything. Oh, like weapons? Anything you wanted, right? Yeah. So we're gonna, uh, so in Russia to export anything, it's as near as I can tell, it has to go through a series of custom clearances. So we're gonna be going through and helping out uh, Mikhail as well, so that folks here can get a hold of his designs. And they're like the Russian designs are just they're just kind of different. They're very different than what everybody right. in the United States and North America designs. Yeah. So they have their own flavor. They definitely do. And so uh, Misha just dropped his inertia knife. And what's interesting about that is the way the handles offset from the blade. Yeah. Okay. And so as yep. that comes it's in. Like this. Yeah. So as it comes in, it's going to it's gonna hit. And then the, the ass end, because it's behind, rocks it in. So it's kind of, it behaves differently. Hmm. Um, and that whole kind of tech, you can find Russian competition shooting pistols in which normally in the, in the US, hey, Alex, can you see my finger? So the barrel, the barrel will come in and it's over top of the grip. And so when everything slides and comes back, you're, you tend to get more recoil. Or they have ones where the barrel is lower and more aligned on the wrist, so it pushes back and it doesn't give oh, us no much kid. muzzle flip. Right, so there's, there's some really, really interesting things. The way the Russians solve problems is fascinating. And they have a different way of thinking than we do, for sure. Culturally very, very different. Um, and I don't understand why, but like, so as an example, um, there's a design of a firearm uh, and ammunition that's referred to as captive piston. Yeah, now, about that. I've, I've been around some really weird shit for a long time <laughs> and been into some really weird stuff for a long time. Uh, there's a guy on, there's a guy on Instagram. His name's Billy Trident. Um, I started following him, by the way. So Billy Trident has some of the most eclectic knowledge on exotic, on exotic weaponry that I've ever come across. And so it's not, it's also not one of those things where he's just like doing a quick Google search and just cutting and pasting like some fellows do. Yeah, this yep. is this Billy is Billy Trident, man. He's got some wild shit on his page. So his stuff. Uh, that's a pro uh, that little pistol is something he's doing with Turner CNC. Uh, Turner's out of Nevada, I think. 
Um, but going through like the old Godfather stilettos, like the OTFs, yeah, um, ballistic knives. Yeah, he that's has wild. some of the that's most a ballistic knife, the one in the middle there, right there. Yeah, he's got some wow. most eclectic knowledge of stuff like that that I've come across. Like I myself, like I've never even seen a ballistic knife in person. I, I like for for us, they're they're like they will get me jailed. I think I saw a homemade one at a gun and knife show once a while back. But right there, that's the the rock or uh, whatever that gun is called. But it has the barrel below the top. Yeah, to, to kind of go through. And yeah, change right that. there. Yep, changing the recoil. So the rhino. Yep. Going through and looking at that, that looks like a revolver that fire. Yeah, it fires from the bottom cylinder instead of the top. That makes sense. Right. So it's just the way that they'll go through and solve the problems. So you go through and you look at cap to piston rounds are a perfect example. So what causes what causes the noise of a gunshot, right? So, well, it's the projectile breaking the sound barrier. Okay, why does, an, why does a uh, 45 ACP make a bang? Because a 45 ACP, the round, is traveling 800 to 850 feet per second, depending on a, a few things, barrel length and stuff like that. And we're right, like, yeah, there's super hot rounds that you can put in them. We're talking just like 45 ACP ball. Why does it make the bang? explosion i mean I don't, so I don't. the so the bang is made by the hot gases contacting the air okay. right so the cooler air so there's a bunch of things that can get that to happen but we have these hot gases contacting there and that creates a pressure wave it goes through and like does a whole bunch of things but it's the hot gases that cause that bang to happen okay. right so the russians looked at it and said or sorry so everything that we do with suppressors is all based on the work of a guy named maxim M-A-X-I-M, like the Maxim gun, mm -hmm. right? So Maxim was kind of the guy that was the OG in the suppressor world. And there's a bunch of ways that the tech and stuff like that has changed where there's a company that goes through and use turbine bladings to go through and create pressure drops and all that, sure. right? But essentially it's just creating a pressure wave, right? And then that just goes through and do it. So all silencers are essentially use a tube and a series of baffles to go through and slow down the hot gases as they contact the air so we don't create a sudden enough pressure wave, right? So that's why things like adapters to, threaded adapters that allow you to thread a oil filter on the end of 22. Yeah, those are awesome. They work great. They work fantastic. And they work They work for 22, they work for 45. Um, there's all sorts of, oh yeah, my man Alex. Pulling there you go. Out. So the, these things, like I think, it, I think the tax stamp costs more than the adapter. But, really yeah for the oh you have oh okay I'm, i forgot that you have to have the adapter yeah like i'm a lot of fun just like this one but you know, uh, a really quality suppressor can run close to a thousand dollars by the time you pay the two hundred dollars you know, tax <laughs> stamp and so look at uh, that it's pretty effective not not maybe as effective as a thousand dollar suppressor but they work pretty well uh, let's see. For pot smoking, even they work okay. There's a pot right there. Oops. We round the chamber. Wish we had one popped out there. Okay. Good old 22 automatic. You never know whether they're going to work or not, do you? Okay. Well, that's a 22. It's going to be silent as hell. Oh my God. All right. Got him. So your action your, and your impact is louder, right? Yeah. It's impact. Yeah. The bolt sliding is louder than the. Yeah, to the actual shooting, and then, and so he's doing that with an oil filter, and that like that's comparable to an integrally suppressed Ruger Mark II, right, or Ruger Mark IV, which are excellent. Yeah. Um, so all of that's based on baffles. It's essentially muffler technology. Sure. Cool. The way the Russians looked at it was like, well, the hot gases contacting the air are going through a great this pressure wave, right? Yeah. Okay. Then. Why are we letting the hot gases contact the air? How so, do you go about separating them then? Well, so they built a they built a device, they built a type of round that's called a captive piston. And good luck finding information on captive piston. Right? It gives you an idea of the depth of knowledge that Billy has because you can't just Google it and find a lot of info on it. Essentially, what you have is think like you have a sh like to just oversimplify this. You have like a shotgun shell, and instead of a instead of a shotgun shell primer, you have like a like a ram set or like a hilti charge. Yeah. And then you have 
as that goes off, it drives a piston forward and it's got, you know, like a Morris tape or something like that in the front of this tube, but it would be like a metal tube, right? So as it hits, it slams in seal. So there's this piston that goes forward in front of the piston is a projectile. So the yeah, piston like this, you found out. you did a way better job finding that than I did. So as this charge so goes off, it slams the red out, part. it slams forward and seals. Whoa. Right, and this entire projectile goes forward. So you're separating the whole process. The gases never leave. Where do the gases go? They stay contained within that cylinder, like within the within the cartridge. There must be an incredible amount of pressure in there. Then. Well, you can look, the case wall is quite a bit heavier, right? Oh, it does look, yeah, way thicker. Right? So to go through and make rounds like that is, to say it's a royal pain in the dick would be an understatement. Um, so your rounds would be, you know, probably several dollars each. Is that something the KGB was using? It's definitely a very specialized niche round. Um, they had revolvers that did it. They had a few, like that PSS that he's looking at, PSM. They had a few semi-automatics that did it. Here. And did you know you can legally erase serial numbers from all your guns? If you scratch... Gather. What? So this is your... Yeah. So when it goes off, it slams the piston forward. It drives the projectile out. Now, there's a few different designs. There's a semi-auto. Which what this one is. Right? There were like old school kind of Derringer style, where it's like a like a brake style over under. And then there were revolvers. So you can have a revolver or a Derringer that shoots suppressed. So with these with these ones, these semi, semi-autos, the loudest sound was the action. To give you an idea, this tech is was like, they had this tech figured out in the 50s, like yeah. mid 50s. So is this is this just old technology then or did they, they continue to pursue this and perfect it? The captive piston. So everything that they were doing for stuff was like wet work related. Yeah. Like in, with the captive piston was then based on how do we go through and make the action cycle quieter. They've had the, the, the Russians, right? The Kremlin, right? Like the, the guys who were doing very niche work had this tech since the mid 50s. Wow. So to give you an idea, like when things were outlawed typically in your country for firearms, like, you know, the full auto assault weapon ban, sure, blah, 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 right? Machine gun ban. There haven't been new machine guns that have been allowed in, like allowed into the country or have been, or sorry, for sale to civilians for a very long time, right? Late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Like it's been a minute. Yeah. And so anything that's out there is kind of shot out. When these were, when these were, outlawed for you guys they were like no turn them in like you couldn't they didn't mess with them at all right like you you aren't allowed to have them so to find anything that's capped with piston like at a gun show or something like that is not very likely yeah so just kind of a neat example of how the russians would solve problems in the respect that well the hot gases are making the bang why am i letting that why am i letting hot pressurized gases contact the air when i can just contain them yeah and so that's why you start seeing some really that's interesting out of the box thinking right there, problem yeah. solving. Yeah, um, you go through and you look at the way that, like, like people talk scamp technique. They're like, oh, you know, it's kind of fruity as shit. Blah blah blah, and it looks weird. It absolutely does. Some sometimes, right? So, from um, so like scamp, IVA, uh, Amadu, and I mean, there's some like big back and forth as far as like who kind of came up with this thing, right? But within Russian martial arts, like Systema is an example, Vladimir Vusiliev out of Toronto. And Systema is a large family of things. And I've done martial arts seriously for more than 20 years. I've taught in two languages in four countries. Um, I have put my skills to work in the real world, um, as well as I currently train with just a bunch of monsters, like current professional former fighters. And if you're wondering, they take my lunch money regularly. <laughs> but I got a pretty good... What an honor, though. They're guys like if you have a if you have the strap, you should be beating up me. Like I should be working, right? Yeah. So I've I've had some pretty good exposure, whether it's like, you know, hanging out of a box, gym of Tijuana to work on my head movement, um, going through and training with a comp with a uh, I did judo with a uh, with a team and the, the one coach had been to the Olympics four times. Wow. Twice competitor, twice a coach. 
like the whole club was competing internationally, right? Like I just have been around, I've had the opportunity to be around a lot of guys and gals that have to make their stuff work. And I've also gone through and had to make stuff work myself. So people look at something like Sistema and there's a whole bunch of different types of Sistema and different factions within it. But you look at like Vladimir, what Vladimir Yusiliev is doing, they're like, oh, right? No, no, that's just fruity shit. That's not going to work. Well, the way that they're, right, the strikes don't look like they're effective because I'll just say American. And when I say American, I mean Western mind, right? Sure. So we go through and have certain ideas in America and in the West about how power is generated. So, and a lot of that comes from boxing, right? So you go through and you look, there's that basic torquing. And so there's this tension that's, right, there's this torque and torque and torque and torque. The way the Russians generate force and like Slavic ways, because I've seen it come out of Croatia, there's a real, there's a very specific box style that comes out of, out of, out of an area in Croatia called Pula, right? And I got a chance to meet a guy named Valamir, who was a very, very effective boxer from there. The way that they're generating their force is taking steps from side to side, right? So if my weight is in my right foot, it means my right hand is loaded. If my weight is in my left foot, my left hand is loaded. So just me transferring my weight from my left foot to my right foot means that all of my mass is transferred. And then there's certain ways with loose and like ball and chain type energy where you wind up compounding angular velocities. So my fist rolling over, my elbow coming up, right? Well, my elbow coming up is creating angular velocity in my hand. My wrist rolling over creates this angular velocity, right? And so we have the shift of the body weight, we have the arm coming around and they'll step. And as they do that, they'll load up the gogial tendon. A gogial tendon reflex is like a stretch tendon reflex. It's the reason when you see a guy try to hit something as hard as they can, they pull their hand back. So you can load that up um, or you'll see them bounce, right? Bounce into their leg and pop out mm -hmm. right? like a shot putter does. So as this weight's transferring, as that shoulder's pulling back, it stretches all this stuff out and then things come through. Now, if you look at any of those things individually, there's not a lot of velocity on it. And you stand back and look at it from a macro level without seeing the details, it doesn't look like there's a lot of speed on that contact surface, right? Well, it doesn't look like this guy's moving very, very hot, very fast, very just efficiently. Way. It's just efficient. And so I remember I was in a boxing gym in Tijuana I work in a basic combo, right? Uh, a three or a one, two, three, jab, cross, hook. And so I have, because I've bounced around to a bunch of different places, kind of, I can do a bunch of different things, right? So like a jab can be thrown like probably 15 different ways, depending on the boxers you talk to. Sure. Right, so I go through and I'm working this combo with a guy, he's holding the mitts and, just, and I just pop, pop, I throw my hook, pop, pop, throw my hook, but I'm throwing a Russian hook. And so when I'm going through, I'm landing that hook right before the end. It's like I have a cup in my hand full of damp dirt and I'm trying to shake it out, right? So similar how you'd pop a whip and I'm doing all this bang, right? Bang. And the coach comes over and is like, yes, so, yes, so, right? That, right? See, yes, so, yes, like that, right? And so he comes over and he sees, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Do it like this, right? Because what I was doing was figure quotes wrong. It was wrong based on what they were teaching, what they do for boxing. Sure. Even though I was hitting harder than every single person in the room, it was wrong. Right. And if you were to watch me do it without the sound on, just watch me do that movement. It doesn't look like I'm doing anything. Right. There's no way that that should work. Right. There's no way that you should be hitting that hard because of the, of the American or the Western understanding of how that works. But when you start going through and looking at all of these things coming together, you're like, huh. Yeah. It's beautiful when it works. And that's why Scamp is so cool. Because, and you're right, that's why, like, the Western way of thinking is like, well, it doesn't seem like it should work. So, you know, like, you know, I, like I talked about with Thomas when I interviewed him on Instagram, you know, it's just, uh, we're stubborn. We're stubborn, man. We're stuck in our ways. But Scamp is, uh, it's pretty cool and it does work it's definitely 
I, I would say culturally in the West, it's easier to make a bigger candle than build a light bulb. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's so, a good analogy. Like if we go through and we look at it, it's like, okay, well, there's this way that's established and we know that that works. So why would you do anything else? Yeah. Right? And so that's kind of the way that belief happens. So you go through and you look at, like, you look at someone throwing, you look at someone throwing Scamp or IVA or a, a Madu. Right. Right? And you're like, you look at that initially, like, that's some fruity looking shit. Like, that looks weird. To, to like, someone what, like, that doesn't throw or yeah. understand things, yeah, it's it's very strange looking. But to someone like me that, you know, is a, a student of it, I think it's pretty fucking rad. It's different, right? It's it really, works. really different. Well, and, and I mean, at the end of the day, what's the result? Right? Does Does the knife go, does the knife go into the target where you want it to? Right. So going through and like, I could throw knives somewhat before I before I started learning scamp. Mm-hmm. I, I had a reasonable level of success. I could use a bull whip. Um, I taught it, but like I got a black belt in Bujinkan Ninjutsu. Throwing weapons was a part of that. I put, screwed around with throwing knives when I was a kid. Probably yeah. like everyone. Sure. Right. Like throwing street sweeper bristles and all sorts of stuff. So it's like, well, why learn that? Right. And what I would say is like IVA, Amadu, Scamp. If the goal is you want to learn to throw a knife and stick it at four meters in a weekend, I would do it. I would I would pick something else <laughs> because it is, I can't speak for IVA uh, because I'm not directly involved with it. what I can tell you about, but there's definitely some kind of carryover, right? Like there's Michael. Similar. Michael, shit. I'm going to mess up your name, Mike. Yeah, Michael. Linapowicz. Lebovich. Le... Anyway, another Canadian guy out, uh, out in Ontario, Marcus Method. And who was the other full tan guy who was there? They were throwing cops. That was Zoltan, but he, yeah. he was not full tank, but, you know, yeah. still a good guy. So there's a whole bunch of ways that they're doing their things, but it's they're all very technique heavy. It's a very technique heavy way to accomplish this goal, right? It's going to take a while. It's very specific. Scamp is one of those things where to do scamp right, as I understand it, as I'm being told to do it by my coach, mm-hmm. it's incredibly frustrating, right? Like, okay, right? Like I'm working back and I'm talking to you. I was like, hey, so like I like sent his video and I'm like, I got a stick at seven meters. Like that's big. No spin, seven meter stick. My first time I ever did it. It's, right? it's hard and it's like yeah my coach just told me i gotta change my grip because <laughs> it's not quite right well, and it's just like there's a certain amount of it like how willing are you to submit yourself to the process yeah and to do like if the goal is that you want to be able to stick something at five meters in a weekend iva scamp amadu right any of those types of ways are not the way that i would do it sure so it's like okay then why bother with it, right? Why would you pick to learn that when there's easier ways to learn? It's the closest thing to, ma- to magic I've ever seen. Yeah. I watch it and I'm like, it's the closest thing to magic I've ever seen. And you know what? I, I think it's awesome. I, it's cool. I am first and foremost, I'm a knife thrower, but I love knife throwing. I love it. I love watching it and um, all those Russian styles. It's, it's magical, like you just said. And it's difficult though. And I've tried from learning from watching because that's what I've always done is that's how I know how to throw. Just watching other people on the, on the internet, but there are definitely some hidden secrets and it's difficult. It's very difficult. And me being the way I am, I'm gonna take the easy route and I'm just gonna chuck that knife in the way I know how to. Well, how many, how many reps do you have A per lot. throw, right? Like 20,000? I don't know. Like I've under, thought about like that. That'd un, be cool to know. Like underhand half spin, probably 30,000 reps. I don't know. Man. Right? It's hard like, to put a number on it. I have no idea. Right? Yeah. So like a lot. Yeah. So it's like, well, why do you learn to do it? Right? Why do we do it? And so what I would say is that the American obsession, and when I, like, I would say that Loic throws an American style, like a Western style, right? Absolutely. Right? You Baseball at, shit. Oh, he's like, he's. He's a pitcher pitching them right in there right so you look at that and the american obsession is with 
how much. Hey, pull him up, will you? Uh, at Loic. Uh, you'll see him. L O W I K. He's incredible. One of my best friends. Loic, right there. He's just a beauty. Yeah, he's a fine specimen of a man. <laughs> and in, in this video, Alex, he's throwing a knife similar to that chaos that we were just checking out in your uh, your kitchen. He's he's nuts, man. But sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh no, like like he's it's really really difficult to appreciate. <laughs> Dude, like, like he, laser beams. Like a no-spin 60-foot throw? And it's about as close to a no-spin throw as it gets because most no-spin throws are quarter spin. But his, some of his throws are damn near perfect. I love that guy. I miss him. Like just hammering in there. Yeah. Like look at him throwing a surgeon or there's that... Raiden or whatever the Raiden Raiden I think Raiden? Raiden his original design it's a coot it's right there that's him throwing a sling bottom bottom middle the one that kind of right there yeah. that's his original design um backhand no spin he's see I was telling you today yeah his forehand there's one where he's <laughs> where he where it's like 60 feet yeah he's yeah, like yeah, yeah I can't throw I can't throw farther than this on my property 60 feet no spin Go fuck yourself. Yeah. He's right? fucking like, rad, man. Like just but you go through and you look and watch how hard this is. Oh man. It's insane. Isn't the, the story about Cain and Abel? Or uh Oh yeah. Wait. Like I'm surprised as There's a biblical story about a sling, right? Uh David and Goliath. David, Goliath. David and Goliath. Thank you. Sorry. I'm Cain surprised he doesn't yeah. knock the uh knock the casing right out that baseball. <laughs> right? So that was in slow motion. <laughs> yeah, and it just like teleports. Right? So but you go through and you watch him throw. He he's got one where he does a breakdown on his technique. And yeah, he goes into detail. Arm. So the American obsession, the Western obsession with knife with with knife throwing, generally speaking, is how hard can I throw? How much power can I generate? I would say that the Russian obsession is how efficiently can I apply power? Sure. How efficiently can I transmit that force that I'm producing into the implement my hand? Yeah. All right. So inefficiently is small body movements, right? Like because the Russian stuff, you're not throwing it. It's more like a martial arts technique. Right, there's double hip Absolutely. action, there's right dropping the weight. There's a whole bunch of ways that it can be done. And that's why I think Thomas Holtman excelled and he learned so fast. And congratulations to him on becoming be, becoming an official instructor for SCAMF because I think it's fantastic. And he, he really put the time in. True. And, you know, he's been a martial artist for, I think he said 40 some years. And um, he just understands it and he followed it to a T. And uh, he is where he is because of it, I think. Yeah, there's some guy in like the knife groups that thought, he, thought fighting was a good idea. Like guys like probably a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. The longest standing brown belt in judo history. Yeah. Right. Just got his black like fights in the dog brothers. Like, Are you talking about the guy that wanted to fight Thomas? Yeah. Like yeah. good luck. He's like, fly to Las Vegas, I'll fight you. I was like, mm. Thomas is like 15, 20 years older than I am. My strength and conditioning is on point. I got a lot of martial arts <laughs> experience. I I wouldn't fight Thomas. I'm like glad I, I'm glad he's my friend. I don't I don't think it would be close. Like he is he is an incredible knowledge base of martial arts yeah but the guy can also bang yeah and if you don't believe that just go look up gung fu dog on youtube yeah and you can Check see him out. beating the shit out of people yeah right like yeah pull that shit up the the dog brothers like three section staff is a gung new weapon fu, but right? the uh the recycle dog. time on yeah. it is like too long well he takes exception to it the bald guy right there gung fu yep. dog right so he takes exception what to the it fuck? and yeah, and goes over and is like, I disagree with you and proved everyone wrong. Like he is, he's an incredible martial artist. <laughs> right. like tons, tons of respect for him. 
Oh shit. That guy's fucked, yeah. So his technique is just to get on you. It was what it looks like. Well, he's tie you up. He's a very, very good. He's a very, very good grappler. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So here's him with his three section staff. Yeah, recycle time is too long. Good luck, my friend. All right. Like, yeah. Anyone that's never played with a flail does not understand how much force is on this. Dude, it's three sections. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like he he's earned every little bit of it. All right, Alex, that's enough. Man. That's so wild. with with the scamp stuff, you're not pitching anything. You're not throwing anything. You're generating force in the same way as that you. It's more like you throw a punch. It's more like right. You're using hip rotation. You're shifting body weight, transfer all that. It's torque. Doesn't look like you're throwing anything, and so that going going combining with right your stretch uh, your stretch tendon reflex going through and like as an example you don't pass your arm through right like I'm taught to go through and, sh- and and it should stay straight because you're projecting all the force forward instead of yeah. it coming down and I, it's sliding out. I follow through. Just like Loke was doing, I pass. Dude, sometimes my arm hits my body or yeah. my other arm because I'm following through so much. It's just what I know. Well, and it's it's not that it's it's right or wrong. It's just like here's the differences. So if sure. you're watching someone that says that they're doing scam, and it's like it's not that I'm an expert at it. I just know what I'm supposed to not do. It doesn't mean that I'm good at not doing it, but I know what the goal is. And so you go through and you look at it. How do we apply that effectively? Um, and it's the reason that all these efficiencies are compounding together, combined with like torques of the hip, stuff like that, in which it looks like they're they're just like flicking the wrist and this thing's shooting like a bullet. Yeah. Um, and for me, that's one of the things where it's like, that's what attracted me about it. I'm like, this is the closest to magic I've ever seen. I know it's gonna be really hard. Now I have a martial arts background as magic well. Magic is hard. It is, right? But sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. To someone, yeah, right. to uh, to an, uh, in, uh, lost Indian tribe, yeah, sure. same thing. Like, so I, I go through and I equate the Western style, the American style of throwing to be like wrestling, where scamp is like a judo foot sweep. I have tangled with good wrestlers, I've tangled with real good judo guys. It's not that I could stop either one, right? Like, you deal with someone who's like an NCAA wrestler, have fun, my friend. Right? If, yeah. you, if you don't know wrestling, you are going to be on the ground. Yeah, very quickly yeah very quickly and i i know what he's doing i just can't stop it right the result yeah. is the same that's gotta be frustrating well with a judo guy like going through kind of right like okay you know like i kind of got and then the next thing you know you've right you're horizontal <laughs> at about five feet off the ground and then you Bam. land on your, you land on your back or your ass and you're like i don't know what you did i don't well, I know how it. i got here no and it was very little effort for that person that had put in all this time to develop it, right? The result is still the same, right? The knife is still sticking. The takedown is still happening. Just do you know how it was done? And yeah. to me, that's kind of the real beauty about it. Um, it's just wild. Okay, so um, we are coming up on an hour. I would like to go a little bit longer if you don't mind. And uh, let's take a a short break. I got to uh, use the bathroom real quick. But after we come back from the break, I would like you to talk more about uh, Delta to Alpha. Sure. And your whole mission statement and how you got into it and all that stuff. I got another bang energy drink to go through. Purple Skittles and stuff is star spangled. Awesome. All right, let's take a break real quick. Second half of this episode. um, What I want to get into now is what is Delta to Alpha? Why did you start this company? And um, I guess, you know, I didn't really know anything about it. I mean, you sent me that knife to test, but um, you also sent a bunch of other little trinkets within that package. And I was like, what the fuck are these? Can you explain some of that? And what, what all you make? Cause you make some wild shit and you didn't even really explain a lot of that stuff to me until last night. And it's a lot of very specialized tools. Yeah. So Delta two alpha, uh, started with myself and another partner. Um, his first initial is D, and mine's A, and so that's kind of where 
that's where the base name started. D2A. With, right? Um, and then as we kind of progressed, that name kind of changed and meant other things, right? And so for different people at different times, this name means different things, right? Okay. Um, D means, or D is Delta in the phonetic alphabet, A is Alpha in the phonetic alphabet. Um, there is, right, like, Alpha, like, an, like so, D or like, like so, Delta in the Greek alphabet um, is commonly in equations in physics. You talk about delta T, delta P. It's change. Delta okay. is the sign for change. It's a triangle, right? So if you see delta T, it's the change in temperature, right? Um, delta P is a change in pressure, right? So delta refers to as change. I didn't know any of that. Right? Alpha in the Greek alphabet, um, it is the first letter. So it can mean the first, right? So when they talk about the alpha and omega, yeah. the first and the last, when they refer to Jesus or something like that, right? Ooh. So Jesus. Oh, you yeah, know that guy, I know him. Like, you know, the guy who makes your burritos down the road, except whose sisters or his mom was probably named Mary. <clears throat> I mean, okay, I, I know what you're talking about. It works out, right? Mm -hmm. That burrito place was fire, by the way. It's pretty good. It was really good. Right, so that name can mean a lot of different things. Um, Initially, the first product that we ever produced was something called the mark. So the mark looks like a question mark. Um, it is the mark. It is not a mark. It's not mark. It is the mark. Um, and it's all one word. And partly that's because I watched the movie Beavis and Butthead Do America when I was a kid. And I wanted to, there's a scene in there where it talks about you can't end a sentence with a preposition as a, as a representative of the United States of American government. All right. Right, Robert Stack's character is grilling this guy about that. You yeah. can watch the movie, it's funny. And so we made it the mark so that people actually had to change the way that they speak about it so that it doesn't seem awkward because <laughs> self-amusement is a large part of what I do. Okay. Um, the mark was made for a instructor that I had. Um, he was the head of an organization. I was an instructor in a system and then due to, right, I made this for him. Uh, offered to him. Uh, he wasn't interested. I even offered to go through and like cover the cost of getting it made because I just want to see one of my ideas out there and like his, his name could be, be before mine and he just wasn't interested. So then we got it made. So through a combination of that and some other internal politics, it's not really worth getting into. I wanted becoming an instructor in his organization, which is fine. Um, and still kind of with the drive of me wanting to get this made because I want to see my idea out there. Um, went and got a couple hundred of, of uh, three different colors made. How long ago was that? 2010, maybe. Yeah, so you've been doing this for about 11 years? Uh, it's been a minute. Okay. All right. Um, and so it was very small. Like, it's the only product that we had. We had a instructional video, and it was used, it was built as a bag hanger, right? So you could be traveling through an airport or something like that. You can go through, hook it over the stall of a bathroom hang your bag, hang your jacket, because you're like 6'3 and almost 200 pounds. And if I can just let you drop trow and reach underneath the stall and steal your laptop, I'd rather do that than fight you because it's a lot less work, right? Yeah. And so especially looking at like airports and things like that, it winds up being, by the time you get your pants pulled up and get out the door, I'm gone just driven to a crowd. So you mentioned something last night that I don't think a lot of people will think about is you said that in a lot of these... Uh, airport bathrooms or places where there's a lot of uh, traffic, they take the hooks off of the walls so you have no option but to drop your stuff where you're at. And then that's when people steal your things. Right? Well, yeah. So like if I want to go through and right and know, know where to be, I just go through and make sure that, that that's taken off, whether I break it off or I do whatever, right? Like it's all pot metal. It's not hard to break off or mess it up. Yeah. So you just go through and do that. And so that was kind of the general premise that we started with. It's shaped like a question mark. It's based off of, the design is based off a science experiment that I saw in third grade. This, it works the same way that you can hang a claw hammer on, on your finger, right? You just pull straight down. Yeah. So initially it was about being able to hang it off of a counter or a table, right? Because, you know, a woman's out and uh, needs to hang her purse, right? So based on that general idea, we then made sure that the uh, the larger hook was enough that we hook it on to a lot of objects. There's a bunch of different uses people uh, come up with them, come up with uh, for them. Right, carrying your groceries. I've seen them used as a whole bunch of different things. People camping, whatever. It's it's kind of neat. I've even seen some people 
um, like a Sokka Jute and uh, Tom Holtman. Um, they, uh, they're big fans of them for uh, self-defense stuff, going through and doing Hojo Jitsu, which is like a Japanese rope bondage thing. Uh, the two of them are working on, on a real neat project, um, kind of with some what's old is new, but like rediscovered material. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, Alex, can you bring up Delta to Alpha design on Instagram and then look for an example of what we're talking about so people can kind of understand? I think it would be better to have a sure. visual. Yeah, it's that top one it's, there. it's hard to... The black. Right there, yep. <laughs> now, we want to go down quite a bit, right? So, okay, so see that thing that's a hook? That blue one? Right there. That's one of the uh, one of the original ones. That's cool. So It totally makes sense now that you were talking about, like, it hangs, yeah. and you're able to hang things off of it because of the center of balance, right? Yeah. So we went through, and there's been a whole bunch of variations of it. The original ones were made out of, we call it puck board. It's high-density polyethylene. So they, they initially came out, they were made of that and that general shape. And the biggest gripe that we had was we couldn't get a nice finish on the surface, right? It wasn't a nice finished product. So we went through and played with some different materials, uh, doing composite. Um, like, so we do G10 now, we've done them out of carbon fiber, we've done them out of, out of acrylic. The acrylic ones kind of had an interesting feature where the small hook would break off into a jagged shard um, oh, wow. under under pressure and if so you needed it to well i mean it, it winds up becoming some, weapon it winds up becoming something pretty interesting pretty quick but people were it was being misconstrued as a defect in the product um so we just went through and went with materials that weren't going to do that yeah so uh we have them there if uh some that are available to delrin which won't do that with some of the polycarbonate which is bulletproof glass uh nice. some multi-tone g10s and like stylized ones i would do a special run for uh, tough possum, tough spelled T U F F, and then possum with no O in the front. What is what's with the O possum? Is it possum like and O possum? I just found this out the other day. Okay. Uh, o possum is native to I think North America, and then possums are uh, a different species in their different part of the world. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure because I didn't even realize that there was an O possum and a possum until recently. I got a lot of dumb facts like you do, so okay, we'll, perfect. We'll see, but um, so uh, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but the other thing I'm really excited about is your development with these jeans that you just came out with, and I would like you to talk about those jeans because they're fantastic, coolest fucking jeans I've ever seen in my life, and uh, you need to tell them where they can get some. So, uh, straight shooter jeans. Um, I'm, I've been a blue jean t-shirt guy my whole life. Uh, I grew up in a... That's it. That's yeah, all I got. <laughs> kind of, like, me, me too, right? I grew up I grew up in 35 to 40,000 people with a drink bucket if I can play cards, right? Blue jeans and t-shirt is what I grew up wearing. That's a suit. Uh, yeah, like, sometimes I'm wearing, like, like a long sleeve with some snaps. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a trailer we just did. But go through... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Put, put that on. <laughs> Yeah, let's watch this real quick. This is the pro, though. It says the professional Muay Thai fighter's name is Will Romero. Kind of choked him out, I guess. All right, so we uh, we, want, cool we wanted a pair of blue jeans. Um, so way back when, there's Chuck Norris action jeans, dude. Yeah, right. epic, old school ad in magazines and shit. Old school. He's bro. doing like the high kick, showing sure. how they stretch and the crotch. So there you yeah, go. <laughs> All right, good old Uncle oh, Chuck. I love it, dude. So. Uh, being a martial artist, um, but also a guy that moves a lot. Like, I wanted something that I could drop into rock bottom squat, essentially hit an Olympic lift, do a crossfit workout in, and I want to be able to throw a head kick. Yeah. 
Um, so that's kind of where we started. Uh, so we've got diamond gusset, high end stretch denim. Um, there's some ways you can tell. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go and run down other companies because that's not how I roll. But you can tell the difference in quality of the denim that we use versus some of our competitors. And I'm talking like big names, not like other guys that are kind of uh, at our notoriety. We're very niche, very boutique right now. If you take our jeans and you a new pair of our jeans, put your hand on them before they're washed and rub it up and down, ours don't turn your hands blue. Some of our competitors do. Yeah. And so like you walk around with like blue legs and blue hands until you wash them a few times. Um, and then we want to go through and add some additional features. So uh, there's, yeah, so those, those, those up on screen right now are called Tango Eyes. Those allow you to carry extra kit. So with the Tango Eyes, Tango Stays, which are also a barbed elastic, but like a lot more rugged and manly and yeah. definitely not something that you would see in anything that your daughter had like no, as no a toy. Hair ties. It's way different than your daughter's toy. Way different. All right, so it allows you, you to go through carry an extra mag. So that's stand, uh, That's a, uh, a Canadian legal Glock mag, which we're restricted 10 rounds. We Canadian have, legal? We're restricted 10 Doesn't rounds. Doesn't sound very fun. Uh, there, there's way less freedom up there, right? Caca! <laughs> way less freedom. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's a fully loaded, uh, loaded Glock mag. One of the biggest issues when you have to carry in a non-permissive environment, right? Whether you're, you know, rolling dirty, run slick, if you're doing UC, whatever that is. What do I do with my extra mag? Right. Right. And I so non-permissive. Can you explain that a little bit? So non-permissive environment means you are not allowed by law to carry a firearm. So uh, just in case you absolutely have to. Or, this gives or, you options. or you just can't be seen to be carrying one, right? Sure. So if you look, go through and look at Canada, the people that are carrying firearms are either police that are working in plain clothes and don't necessarily want to get made, or criminals, or you see guys that kind of offer, like guys who are operating in the gray, whether they're doing kinetic service, which is a cute euphemism that you can look up. Um, but going through and looking at that, you need to be able to carry an extra mag and if you're a lean guy like I am, you don't have tons of extra real estate. So right. this allows you to carry an extra mag with the least amount of bulk possible while still maintaining your bullet tip orientation. For me, the way I was trained, I'm bullet tips to work my belt buckle, right? Um, okay. And so when you go through and you index and come up, it's gonna be in the same place every time. You can carry it if you prefer. Didn't like, you also say that those bands were able to carry a full-size Glock? Yeah, so the, the bigger ones that we sell with it, um, We've done testing and a Glock 17 or Glock 22 uh, loaded with a full mag. Um, you can put it on, you can jump up and down, it stays in place. And it's always interesting because people that will, whenever I show something like that, what a lot of people don't understand is that you, the live in America, is that you guys are very, very blessed. You're very blessed in that you can legally carry firearms. Yeah, we take things for granted for sure. Right, so I wound up getting, you know, I'll, I wound up getting about 7% of people that are like, fuck yes. And I get 7% of people that are like, you're an idiot, right? And I'm like, okay, well, why? They're like, well, I'd never, I'd never carry a pistol in my waistband. Well, there's tons of people that do as a regular sure, part absolutely. of their life. You ever right? seen a movie? Well, <laughs> So, so, so what's the situation where we're carrying it, right? Sure. I go through and I spend some time not in Canada, not in, not in the U.S. And so there are places in the world in which even having a holster is a problem because, okay, why do you have a holster? Where's your gun? Right? And that'll send you to jail. Um, and so what you're getting, what you wind up getting as a pistol is you get what you get. And so it's always funny because I'm like, well... Yeah, like if I have to go through and get a get a Saturday night special, I gotta get some scrap iron, a heater, a chunk, whatever. Um, I kinda gotta gotta make do. And I was talking to one guy, he's like, well, you know, like I I just asked for a Glock. I'm like, have you ever bought an illegal gun? Have you ever bought anything on the black market in a foreign country? And if the answer is no, you don't really get to talk, right? Yeah. So 
there's a big difference between what you want to be able to do and what you have to be able to do. And so like we have a lot of our stuff winds up going to places that aren't the US or are going to people that are going through and doing some work outside where they need to run slick and roll dirty. Now, whether you have to or you should, all of that's up for debate, but our genes give that capability. You can carry yeah. that extra pistol, or sorry, you can carry that extra mag, you can carry that extra pistol. Now let's say you need to go through and get rid of it. You're not walking around with a holster when you get searched, right? Um, and then, you know, are you going through and running like a five shot chief, like a snub nose revolver, sure. hammerless, are you going, right? What are you doing? And also like all its context. So for the people that get that, they're like, this is the best thing ever. And for the people that don't, they think that I'm retarded. But the, okay, regardless of all that extra stuff that you build into the jeans, the oh. hidden pockets, passport pockets, all that stuff, it's like the coolest jeans ever. I mean, they're just really well made. They're some of the best fitting jeans I've ever had. They're and comfy. I love them. And I, and I am biased because you are my sponsor, but I, I'm, I'm being very serious. They're the coolest, the, they're ninja jeans. They're fun. They're, dude, they're, they're fucking fun. awesome. It's like jeans I wanted when I was a kid. Like, I don't know if you remember Bugle Boy. But I Bugle remember Boy, Bugle Boy. Bugle Boy had like all the extra we, we, pockets we were everywhere. Poor. I couldn't afford them, but yeah. Well, uh, oh, what's yeah. that? Rich, oh, I, I don't know. Look at look at you. Oh, Bugle I don't know. Boy they were probably secondhand. Mister Chip and know. Pepper over <laughs> here. Oh, yeah. All that so, fancy shit. That's what I'm saying. It's just it's like it's just cool, man. Yeah. It's there's options. You can get Chip and Pepper jeans again, by the way. What kind? Ch you don't know Chip and Pepper? Uh -uh, oh, yeah. a Canadian thing. Uh Chip and Pepper's like a like Chip and Pepper jeans were like a big like. 90s thing like an early 90s thing huh not familiar i think their logo is like a pair of, like a bulldog your canadian joke went right over my head oh well fuck you and pbr <laughs> you know fuck in your bang drink yeah with the american logo on it by star the way. spangled awesome yeah. that stuff's kicking in <laughs> that, that red line isn't as strong i think bang's a way better product bang, yeah so bang, holler at your boy he can't he said that he can't get a lot of uh american energy drinks so he he wanted the strongest shit. So obviously I took him to the gas station and had him drink a fucking red line, which on the bottle, it says only drink half of it. This fucker down the whole thing was just like chilling, like chilling out. I'd be like fucking shaking great. and jittery and shit. But the flavor wasn't that bad, but like Ooh. these are nice to sip on. Are they? I think the flavor's a little better, right? What like, is the flavor? Uh, grape Skittles. Purple Kittles. It, it, it tastes like purple. It tastes like purple. Purple. Yeah. I can smell colors. Excuse me. Um, so the jeans they took us like two years to develop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To get them right took two years. Dude, it's so cool. Like, I know that took a lot of uh, time and effort. I mean, I can't even imagine what goes into fucking making jeans. And and what I'll tell you is, I'm not 100 percent happy with them. There's some things that we're still going to be tweaking. Everyone so else tweaks. isn't going to notice. Right, but I'll notice. Yeah. Um, and so we have uh, we have another wash coming out, and with some adjustments that'll be made for uh, next year. Nice. Um, but people are going nuts for them, and like we're we're getting some interesting orders to some interesting places. I can't say a lot more than that, but like it's pretty cool to see that level of acceptance. Yeah. Um, and so one of the big questions was, well, like you guys doing all this textile stuff, like what do you know about that? Like, who are you to do that? And I mean, you and I had talked a lot about tall poppy, right? Tall poppy syndrome and foster syndrome, John Day's Law. It's like, yeah. well, who am I, right? Well, there's a guy who was one of my mentors. And he was in the tactical textiles world competing against Eagle and Blackhawk and 511. And he's been, like, he was... He said he was super successful. He was there when 511 was still doing what 511 started doing, which was mountain gear. 511 was a tactical company. 511 refers to the skill level of the climbing rope. Okay. Right? You can look that up if you want. I don't know. So uh, he's the guy that coined the term three day salt back. Right? He's the guy, like, there's a whole bunch of things that he did. He's the guy that developed the stubby boonie, right? Uh, the company was called Drop Zone. That was his line. So, due to a series of unfortunate events, he winds up losing his company. Um, it was more or less taken from him, kind of as he's getting ready to kind of make one last grow. And there's, there's a whole like spiel on that. It's not really my business to talk about, but I was able to bring him on board. And he was there for me when I was no one. When I was when I showed up one in a shop one day, 
met him like 15 years ago. Trying to pay it forward. Well, I, w- I was going through and like had this knife design that I, I wanted want to produce called the H2CR. We mentioned it earlier. And I showed up with a drawing on a piece of paper and I'm chatting with him. And he's like, okay, let me buy him supper. He said, I'll give you all the advice you want. He said, it's free. Choose to do what you want. He was there when I was no one. And now the, like, it's not that we've made it because the reality of it is I'm still working, you know, 80 to 120 hours a week between this and my Bruce Wayne job <sighs> trying to make this stuff happen. Right. And then like, I don't know, three years from now, five years from now, people say I'm an overnight success. But going through and be able to bring him on board has allowed us to move in so many different directions. Right. So our jeans, our Norwegian Ninja shirt, our pack rat soft shell. Uh, we got another jack that we're working on next year. Like there is a lot of stuff that we're really, really excited about. We've got a real cool bag coming and out. And where can you get all this stuff? Delta to Alpha.com, right? Delta to Alpha.com is where we sell it through. Um, people told us to go to Amazon. There's a bunch of things about Amazon and the way that they do business that I just can't get behind, right? Uh, they don't treat their workers real well. There we go. Yeah. Um, H2C is the uh, picture and the cutting tools. Um, like, like just when you're scrolling down there. Go down a little bit. Right. So, so cutting right tools. there, that's cutting tools. That's, that's the H2C. And we have a few different designs as well. There's J7, there's Tengu. Oh, talk about the Tengu. Okay. So the Tengu, um, that's based Re- off of a slight redesign. So, so this is the original. Um, this is based off a design called my Kuchi, which Tantos were carried by the samurai, kind of the, kind of more of the warrior class and Aikuchis were carried by like politicians and prostitutes. So apparently those things have been linked for a long time. Interesting. Right. Okay. Everyone's got a price, <laughs> right? So when we go through and look at that, that design, if you put them like a mirror image, maybe double up spine to spine, it's basically a dagger profile. It's very, very similar sure. to like a Fairbairn Sykes. So we went through and looked at it and said, well, this is neat. The Tengu chassis is a skeletonized version that we wanted to go through and give people the opportunity to make like a kit, right? So, right, so I that is way. why this is skeletonized. It's so, so you can wrapped. choose your wrap. Yeah, so we, uh, we did our hood wrap, snap wrap. Uh, those ones specifically are, a, uh, are kind of a, a one to go type of knife in which uh, that blade profile is very, very good at piercing textiles and organic medium, which is a, right? Like, so it it was designed because at the time you were looking at going through and punching it through silk, which- Which isn't much. uh, Modern, like Kevlar is just modern made silk. It's synthetic silk. Really? Yeah, like the original bulletproof vests were made from silk. Just woven. They were expensive as shit, but the original bulletproof vests and a lot of your like armor was silk. I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, that's what Kevlar is. It's synthetic silk. So I think the trademark's owned by DuPont. Yes. So we went through and used the Tengu and that's where that comes from. But the Tengu and the J7 initially were, it was a chassis. It was already ground. Lots of guys wanted to go through and kind of customize a knife and stuff like that. So we're like, okay, we'll put out a couple different designs. And set out with some hood rat snap wrap, which is like a rubber lace that you can go through. Yeah. Uh, it's a rubber lace that you can go through and kind of wrap. And there's a few different ways to wrap your handle. You can, we go through and talk Very about Very grippy, by the way. It's, it's like a bicycle tube. It Even more tacky than that. Yeah. It's, cool. a, yeah. it's a silicone-based rubber. Okay. Right? So think like dry caulk, right, from your in your shower. Dry what? Caulk. Oh, C-A-U-L-K. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Right, so it's kind of tacky um, and it's rubberized like that. And then guys go through, did some videos on, hey, here's different ways you can finish it. Like if you take carbon steel and you boil vinegar on your stove for five to 10 minutes. Change the finish. It, you get kind of like a gunmetal patina. Nice. Like, like a black oxide. There's two different types of, there's two main oxides of iron. That is my favorite knife of all time. The J7? You sure <laughs> threw it okay. I know, it's just, it was, you know, it was just uh, shorter than I was used to. So front heavy. Front, so I'm the exact opposite of front heavy guy. So the J7 is a modern interpretation of a kunai. All right. So if you look okay. at it, it is. So for those that don't know, a kunai is a Japanese knife, finger quotes knife. It was as much spade. a trowel or a spade as it was anything else. Yeah. All right. So it this is weapon. 
It's an improvised weapon. It's a trowel. It's it's a whole bunch of things. So this is a combination of a modern tanto and a classic, like like a modern tap tanto or the Americanized tanto, and a classic draw point dagger. All right. So the point is is on center, so that it goes through and. If you're going through and using your line of thrust, it comes in there. Yeah. Um, you have more stock so that the point is beefed up and so that it's got... Another thing is, can you talk about why your knives are so short? Like, you talked about there's different carry. Sure. So, like, with this, it was it was built as a knife that you could do a bunch of stuff with. Right? So, hey, cool. You're stuck in your apartment or whatever because of whatever circumstance that I don't feel like talking about. And... You just right. You just ordered pizza, and why not go through and throw your knife? And you can do that from like that'll throw just fine as a forward weight from three meters, which is more than enough to sit in your living room and chuck your knife. Absolutely, out. have some fun in your apartment. Uh, like there's uh, guardian protection. What's his name? Fellow who's just who's yeah, just yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, I think it's guardian protection uh, on Instagram. Uh, hell of a great guy. He goes through and teaches a little bit. And the guy's a, he's, he's an amputee. He's, he's missing uh, missing uh, one of Guardian his Guardian underscore personal underscore protection. Yeah, so he's missing uh, a good part of one of his legs. I think he's I think he's just above the knee. And and, and by the way, real quick, Nico. Yeah. He he just uh, he just started a GoFundMe uh, to get one of his prosthetic legs, and he has a three thousand dollar goal. So if anyone would like to donate to him, guardian underscore personal underscore protection, um, I think that's a very good cause. Yeah, I absolutely. Mean, well, I mean, you want to get walking, right? Sure. Uh, we'll uh, we'll throw we'll, we'll throw some heat on that. Um, good call. So he's throwing knives. He's teaching himself no spin. Uh, this guy. He's doing pretty good. Two at once. You know. Two at once. He's throwing left-handed. I mean, like, despite being left-handed. I, I actually talked about getting him to Danger Fest, but the bad thing is... Uh, oh, the sand. The sand. sand the sand is tough, man. His, but uh, we would, we would uh, work it out. Well, yeah, we would just make it happen, right? So he's going through and making it happen. He, he wound up getting the J70 sent videos. Did he? Working on his no, his no spin, right? Like, he's just... He's probably one of the more consistent guys training out there, and it's like, this motherfucker doesn't have excuses. No, right? he he's, just he's doing it, the damn right? thing. Tons of respect. Tons of respect. Um, so as far as like the J7 was, it's like modern interpretation of a kunai. You don't wrap it up. You can throw it in the pizza box from sitting on the couch or across the room. Three meters. I mean, you can probably find three meters, 10 feet, stick in the cardboard, right? Kind of fun to play around with. Yeah. You and I differ quite heavily. I like for no spin. I like stuff that's front heavy. Because when I well, when I throw it, it feels like it pulls it out of my hand. I understand that hard. there are there are certain people that prefer that stuff. Bo Tate, uh, owner of uh, uh, Valley Axe in Sarnia, he happens to love front heavy knives. He's a very good no spin thrower. I mean, at any competition, he could be in the top five. He's he's good, and um, it's just strange. It's, so it's you admit that you're wrong, man? No, okay. I'm in, I'm admitting that I'm right. I'm just saying. Uh, Valley Axe on Instagram, maybe. I don't, I, I don't know if he's actually on Instagram. He might be just Facebook only, but, um, what was I going to say? So we built that. And the reason that the reason I handle skeletonized was partly about the wrap, but it was also about how do I go shoot, go through and shift more ratio of the weight forward. Yeah. Um, we went through and it's a shorter handle. Why is it a strip? Like, why is it not a full length handle? And why is the knife not 12 inches long? Yeah. Because you're throwing it in your apartment from across the room. Well, there's also different carrying laws in Canada. Absolutely. As well. Absolutely. That's what you told me, right? So, what's, what's interesting is federally, our law is more or less the same. Right. So, you guys have a lot of like state sovereignty. So, as an example, if I'm in California, I could probably smoke grass. Last time I smoked grass, I called it grass. Give you an idea. Yeah, you're old. I can I can slam kratom. I can do a whole bunch of stuff. But if I go to like Indiana, that might differ. That might differ, yeah. right? Totally um, illegal here. I was in Tennessee. I was in one county in Tennessee, and I could walk in. I could buy 
Right, half the gas station was fireworks, and nearly the other half was like malt liquor and shit. Hell yeah! Right, they sold a little bit of gas and chocolate bars, but it was like eighty percent liquor and fireworks, and it was awesome. I think I even buy ammo there. Where I went across state lines into Kentucky, and it was a dry count. Yeah, dry counties are wild. Right, like so, it's just like it varies so much. Where, like federally, a lot of our laws are the same. Um, you can carry in Canada uh, up to a four inch blade concealed, um, but there isn't anything in the criminal code about the size of a of, of a knife that's unconcealed. You literally could have a machete on you. Oh, okay. And as long as it's not concealed and you're not being an asshole, it's unusual. Sure. And if you're panhandling and you have it, it could be it can turn into something. But sure. It's it, it's not. It's not the same level of problems that it is here. Okay, I gotcha. Like, same same for Indiana. You can open carry a sword. I just wouldn't advise it. I would probably not suggest it. It's cool as hell, but I don't, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, like, you know, your dinner rape here or whatever, right? <laughs> um, so, the handle on that, skeletonized, it's smooth, tapered, because it was easy to go through and throw no spin. Right? For and you. Like, in an apartment, sitting on your couch at three yeah. meters. So anyway, like, um, that's what I was going to say earlier. You know, you were still new to the knife throwing world and community when sure. we first started, uh, you know, talking. So yeah. now that you've uh, gotten your hands on this weekend, you've gotten your hands on a bunch of different knives. I, I put every knife I could think of in oh, my man. collection into his hands. I, uh, I was throwing a, like, I threw the baby too, threw like a whole bunch. What was, what was that one that I was, like, that I was trying to stick the can so that's the one that Lowick gave to me, right? Yeah, the set of three. Yeah, it was a set of three from Opus. Opus Knives at Opus Knives on Instagram, and it was one of his first designs that Lowick, when he came up here from France for Danger Fest 2019, he brought it to me as a gift, and they were super cool knives. But I even did a review on them. They were like very specialized. It had a, a little kind of a spine on top of the back top the top of the blade the bottom, which yeah. which hinders oh, uh, okay. half spin and then it had the point on the back which aesthetically i didn't like but they throw fine but it just wasn't my favorite knife and they've been sitting around for so long and i'll let you throw them and you you took to them like a duck to water well like this one right here that's you're throwing those right yeah so i'm i'm hitting that i'm hitting that uh that lighter that's it right there yep. the half spin so I hit four lighters, and based on hilariousness, yeah, um, I, I, we got two fireballs and we got two vapor clouds. Yeah, I didn't include the other two vapor clouds. But, um, but I love the leaves. Watch the leaves. Whoosh! Nice. They lift up. Oh right yeah, there. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see in slow mo, but. And like some of those lighters just like popped and like shot trap lovers. Yeah, it's, the it's one actually, shot like 20 foot behind you or that, something. And so I hadn't really been doing like what stuff I'm doing with, with Misha. I've been really focusing more Ten. on just like, how do I make sure that this thing sticks? Yeah. Right. So like, as you can see, I use a way different kind of like grip for half spin and stuff like sure. that, which may or may not work for someone else. Kind of like a pinch grip. Yep. Um, which I don't know, it works, so whatever. But with those knives from him, right, like I found that they work really well for that gunfighter. Go a, a post back. I think this is his. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right there. His underhand no spin is pretty damn good. And like you said, my underhand half spin is my shit. Yeah. Underhand no spin seems to be your shit. I mean, you're really good at it. So, yeah. Under spin. Underhand half, uh, sorry, underhand no spin is the throw that I probably practiced the least. So, like, well, I mean, even today with that bow shuriken that yeah. you were, you were killing. Like, it's it's probably a, the, the sh it's the throw that I practiced the least. And when I like those aren't even the, some of the best ones I had. There's one where it's like I just twitch my hip, and and it just boom flies like a dart. Yeah. Thomas Holtman has a really nice uh, yes, he does. nice underhand uh, yeah. no spin. Um, but those ones from, those ones from Opus, tossing the can out, boom, and just like, just missing it. Yeah. I want to, 
Yeah, we were working on your first trick shot last night, weren't we? Well, it got the lighter, and like I didn't realize, like yeah, like like hitting the can. It's just timing, right? Like well, like I got to get my throw right, and there was some. Or I almost wonder if I was using the dashy, if I would have been able to pin it in the air. Like if I would have been able, been able to punch it through and carry it in. You you pierced the side of the can a couple times. A, yeah. a more fine tip, I think that you would have stuck that because it's it's wide and it cut the side and did not pierce it all the way. And so even though I wasn't able to do it, like at the end of last night, like my underhand half spin was like I was putting wherever I wanted. So it just wasn't going into the can because the timer was on. Yeah. Uh, I just want to bring this up because I've had these notes wrote down for a while. Uh, Alex, please bring up on Instagram at R O L F Steel or uh, um, shit. Hold on a minute. He has a weird Instagram name. R O L F R E T S E L. The Roaming Ronin. Yeah, that's him right there. Dude, he is ambidextrous, Canadian thrower, and his underhand nose spins are amazing. Dude. He's one of the best. Um, that's his left hand. I think that's his, I think he's left-handed. Backhand, um, uh, backhand Yeah, dude, he is, he's incredible. He's in Teal. Teal there, uh, he'll be on the hall in Toronto. Uh, Let's see. Some, I want to see some underhand no spin. Um, go back a couple posts. He's out. He's outside. Just waiting for uh, out. To come in his yard. Go back another post. No, that's it. That's it right there. Let that fly. Look at that. That's his offhand. Yeah. Is he left-handed? Yes. Like, awesome, dude. That's I mean, they're one. missiles. There's his regular hand. Dude, it's... This guy is so underrated. Just fucking missiles, I I man. He's sick. I've definitely seen him throw before. Look, yeah. I mean... Nice. He has a sick indoor range. Play that. Look at that. It's... Oh, yeah, his that house is awesome, awesome, man. Pop. Yeah, forgive me, man. I don't remember your name. I know you're in the Instinct of Knife Throwers group. I don't remember your name. I apologize. But uh, I just got to give you some love, dude. I love your throwing. You're sick. You're so killing it. He's sick. Killing it. So, like, earlier when we were talking about how, like, I saw Scamp and I was like, it's magic. How he's, like, barely moving. I was like, firing he's, in there. He's got a similar yeah. vibe. Um, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure who he's affiliated with. No one. As far as I know. Just, like. But there's that guy in those natural of, guys. There's that Finnish guy, Jonas or Jonas. Jonas, yeah. Who looks like a Slavic gangster. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, he's, he's not, sick too. I don't think he's officially a scamp guy, but. No, no, no. He's definitely not. He's, he's dissected do, it on his own. He's doing something that's very interesting to watch. All right. And you're just like, okay. Okay. At Jonas Samuel 87 on Instagram. At Jonas Samuel 87. He, he looks like an Eastern European gangster every single time. It's just like this guy's all yours. But like just throwing Go down, missiles. Down. Yeah, yeah, he looks like he's in the KGB or fucking Russian mafia. Right there, the bottom left. Right there. Yeah, right here. Perfect, perfect <laughs> example of like, like, look at this. That's his bow shuriken too. Dude. Just hammering him in there. Yeah. My rebar bow shuriken. Yeah. Yeah, dude, he's... But we can agree he looks like he's some type oh, of... Oh, like, dude, he's he should be in the movie Snatch. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But just like... There's some incredibly skilled throwers out there that are very underrated. Look at that bullet spin. One of the things that I, I'm just fascinated by is Shh. how that bullet spin works. Yeah. Right? Like, it's just, it's just fascinating. There's an argument there to, does it help stabilize things like a bullet? I don't think so, but maybe, maybe it does. I don't know. I don't know how it would work with a flat object, but definitely like with like a football, right? You have to spiral it. It's, yeah, it that's a, that's an argument for sure. Um, but I don't know. Well, um, and uh, what else do you want to talk about? You got some more stuff you want to talk about? Uh, we yeah. like the Tengu so much as a there you go. textiles and organic medium 
uh, doer that we decided to make a Kudaki version of it. Um, also made by Prince Steel Knives, Lewis Prince. Thank you. Also three eighths thick. It's ridiculous. Yeah, the weights are about the same. That one actually weighs five grams more, okay. surprisingly. I'm not sure how. Yeah. And so with, with both of them, we, uh, we made sure that we kept a little bit of texture on it because I find that my hands get sticky. Um, and so you've got to get a little bit of purchase, but a little bit of slide, the same way you get off like a golf ball. Uh, you can see some videos of us putting them through pumpkins and into into, uh, into turkeys or chickens or whatever they were. Yeah, we got stopped short today by the torrential downpour, but we're going to get back on that real soon. Um, yeah, so uh, doing those, you were asking about like what Delta 2 Alpha is. Initially, it was just about getting their ideas out there. Uh, and then it became about how do we go through and using and we use it as a vehicle to meet really interesting people. So whether it's Ed Calderon or it's you or right, just like we it became this way that we could reach out and talk to like Thomas or whoever. Um, and then it became like we sponsored some people like we sponsored you, we sponsored uh, a few years back, we sponsored a power lifter that went and set a world record. No shit. Yeah, sponsored an Olympic lifter, right? Um, there's wow. just a whole bunch of things that we kind of enjoy doing and it winds up being a vehicle for doing that um, and building for for me it's all about building relationships with people um, and first and foremost you need to be a good person you can be skilled but if you if you don't know how to act right I'm not going to be able to teach that to you so um, after yeah, you and I pass well, I'm here, right? So, like, I'll answer. <laughs> yeah, that. but you could have been here. You didn't know me before, really. But I'll answer that question after I'm like you've dropped me off. Oh, the after the, after right? the airport. Okay. After I'm through with you. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, and so it just becomes, it becomes a way that we could meet interesting people that we wouldn't be able to before. Sure. Um, for me, I use a large part of the self-directed education, yeah. right? Because like, for me to go through like you talked about earlier with throwing knives, I had to learn about a whole bunch of. Uh, I had to hurt a uh, whole bunch of material science. Okay, well, what makes these things not break, right? How are we going through an attack, attacking this in metallurgy? Are we going through attacking this with heat treatment? Are we doing a combination of both, right? What makes something that's good? Um, and kind of how is it we accomplish that? Um, what goes into a good pair of jeans? Making clothing is not as easy as your mom making you a pair of pants or a pair of pajamas, a onesie when you're three. Right there to go through new pattern drafting is a very, very sophisticated thing. There's a real art to it because you're taking a two dimensional medium and draping it around a three dimensional object that then needs to move. Yeah, and everyone knows when they have clothes that don't fit right. Yeah, and so it's very difficult to do that. You're going through looking for sizing splits. Um, so, a huge part is about how can I go through and learn more and more and more uh, because for me, I'm addicted to the learning process. Um, as you, as you, well, very much. Nerd. Right? Nomadic nerd for hire, right? Like, as you've kind of figured out, like, you're having some issues with your elbow, right? Dude, that was wild. Yeah. Everybody, I don't know if you guys follow me on social media or not, but I've been having very bad tennis elbow for the majority of this year. And it's gotten really bad. And uh, Ace brought me one of his Delta to Alpha. What's that called? The uh, we used the Brujo band, and then we gave you a couple exercises we're getting you to yeah. work the direction they don't normally. And I'll be honest, you know, he's explained this stuff to me online a bunch, but when he was actually here to help me go through these exercises, I felt the relief almost immediately. And it was, it was, it was wild, man. I, well, my uh, arm feels better for sure. We'll go through and do a couple of videos and show some of those exercises and we'll just put them up because there's no way that you're the only one who's having an evolution. There's no way. I mean, I thought in my head, I was like, oh, this is just the way it's going to be from now on. Yeah, I'm and going to be in dull pain for the rest I, of my life. Yeah, and it, it sucks. You know, I'd be icy hot and ibuprofen and um, it feels a lot better. Thank you. Yeah, and so we just did the one session. So I know. So typically what causes pain um, is a muscular imbalance. Right. So it's that the muscles in one area are stronger than the other. And that typically occurs because of repetitive use. Right. So if we go through and we look very, very commonly, we're turning in with our hands, whether you're working a wrench or working a screwdriver. Right. There's this turning in. Always. 
right? So we wind up with a muscular imbalance with a brachialis, the muscle that goes over top of the elbow on the thumb side, winds up becoming a lot stronger. Um, and so your radial nerve, which is the issue you're having, your radial nerve goes through. And so me just applying pressure, it's like, oh, that really hurts. Well, it's because it's inflamed. Yeah. Right. That, and that then so pretty start, painful. Like I'm now I'm getting like, you know, like I'm starting to get pain in the back of my, like behind my elbow, my tricep. Yeah. What's kind of going on there? Well, your radial nerve goes through your tricep and cuts through your elbow and then in, and then down the brachialis. So it's like, well, it's radial nerve. And so you're like, eh. or I'm like, just touched it. You're like, yep, that's it. So we went through and just went through and worked the reverse motion with some yeah. bands. Bands are really good for that. And so going through and strengthening that, uh, some people wind up issues if you're throwing a lot of sidearm, like you're seeing a lot of the guys that, so a lot of guys that believe that they're doing scam. What I'll tell you what's interesting to me is I've been working for about five months with Misha. I haven't done anything sidearm. So that was the general understanding of what people thought scamp was just from watching other videos. And that went on for years. Mm -hmm. And then until uh, Thomas Holtman came around and then I interviewed him and then kind of blew up and then other people started getting into scamp. There's no sidearm aspect that he's teaching. I've never seen... Part, so I, I can speak with what I've seen, and I have not done anything so far. Maybe further down the road? Maybe. Um, but when you are going through and throwing things through a sidearm, there's a muscle that goes on the inside, or the pinky side of your forearm on your elbow. It's called a pronator teres, right? And it goes across the elbow. If you, stand, if, if you extend your arm, you'll see that it goes from kind of the point on the inside across this is called your pronator teres no. so people will get golfer's elbow or tennis elbow right one of them is your brachialis and it goes through and impinges on your radial nerve which comes inflamed and the other is your pronator teres which is in here right and so you essentially wind up getting like the same way you get a knot in your neck or whatever you get that same type of thing so that needs to be stripped out and both of those things occur typically because of overuse injuries Right. So well, obviously, <laughs> right. Yeah. So if you're going through and you're bouncing off that and you're whipping something over and over, you stretch this out and you stretch this Only out one way all the time, all the time. Right. And boom. Right? Boom. And so we can go through, we can bounce off of that tissue and generate a lot of power. Right. Like go yield tendon right there. Cool. But if we're not doing anything and nobody really talks about doing rehab or prehab, how do we go through and prevent that elbow pain from happening? Yeah. Um, and there's ways to do it, right? So you're feeling that in your elbow because that's kind of the weakest link in the chain. So we need to go through and use that Brujo band, wrap it around there, have you do a few exercises. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, people are go going through and we very commonly work all of our flexors. We bring our hand in together. We had to go in through and splaying it. Yeah. You can do that as, you can do that in a lot of ways. You can use rubber bands, right? You can buy those things online that you see yeah. for grip training. You can even just take like a like a jar or a cup and fill it full of washers and stick it in, splay your fingers and walk around like that. And so you can put it on there and you can move it up and down. We just need to create this pressure to activation and then isolate it and bring it back because we don't do that motion. We're always grabbing, we're always turning in. And basically like an arm wrestling type of a movement, right, to oversimplify sure. it. So we go through and we do a little, like if you're in a lot of pain and you go through and work that in those muscles on the other side, if they're not very developed, they'll develop very, very quickly. And so you can wind up, your body will only get to a point of so much muscular imbalance and then any type of strength that you're going to increase is going to stall out. And your hand will start to literally decrease its range of motion. And it will get weaker and weaker. And you can see this in guys who work a lot of oil rigs around the tongs, guys who are a lot of tradesmen, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Just by going through and correcting those imbalances. And it's, I mean, I had you hooking a toe, hooking a small band on your toe and rotating back, right? And so we'll go through and do some videos tonight yeah, so we that we should. can share them. And it's like, you can do this while you're watching TV. You know, you do it a few times a week. Initially, if you're having some problems, you're going to want to do it like at the end of every day beginning of every day, a couple times, start with what you can do. And then all of a sudden it's not gonna be the issue, right? You're not gonna have that issue in your elbow. It maybe it's your shoulder. Well, if you're constantly going forward and you're not doing anything to strengthen up the shoulder girdle, you're not working your, you know, your rhomboid, you're not working any of that posterior chain, you're going to go through and wind up 
pulling your, like the shoulder joint is a ball and socket. And shoulder impingement happens when you wind up getting pulled forward, typically by the chest. Guys go to the gym bench press a lot, typically complain of shoulder pain. All they need to do is strengthen their upper back and it'll pull that back. No shit. You're counteracting. Right? So muscular, right? So a lot of people with the issue that you're that you're facing, like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna be able to golf. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to throw knives anymore. Um, a buddy of mine's a surgeon down in Mexico. I gave him some stuff to do. He's starting to have problems with his hands. But you're a surgeon, that's your livelihood. Yeah. Right. So going through and looking at some of this stuff, and you're like, there's no way that this is going to work. I remember the first time I did, I was working on one arm pull-ups and my, my pronator terrace is what it was for me, the muscle on the inside. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what, this is stupid. It's not going to work. But at this point, I won't try anything. And that's kind of where you were the other night. You're like, whatever, like, I don't think it's going to work. I'm like, it's not going to make it worse. Well, yeah, I've tried ignoring it. I've tried not being, a, not being a pussy. How did, how did it And, uh, you know, it's still there. Yeah. So I am very grateful that you helped me out with that. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through and put that out there because there's no way it's, it's the only thing. And if people throw lots of sidearm, you're definitely going to be having issues with your shoulder, your pronator terror, yeah. stuff like that. It's only a matter of time. Right? Yeah, no shit. So um, I'm a giant, giant nerd. Right? You want to discuss language, you want to discuss organic ranking cycles, physiotherapy, training animals, like just like get at me. Whatever you want to talk about. I'm good, man. Okay. Training animals, maybe. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, man, we're coming up on uh, two hours here. Fantastic. It was a blast. Thanks that was me. awesome, man. Thanks for coming, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Appreciate you, dude. Thanks for coming down, man. Absolutely. It's, it's been a blast all fucking weekend, man. It's, it's been cool as shit. I wish you could have came down for Danger Fest, but I understand. Well, I want to get to know you, right? Like, my big thing is I like to know the people I'm dealing with. You would have been running around like chicken your head cut off. I couldn't even have yeah. hung out with you. Yeah. So, yeah. so hopefully next year I want to introduce you to more of the knife throwing community because they're okay. amazing people, man. And I'll be better. That doesn't matter. But I'll be better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't matter. I'm going to go through to all your events underhand, no spin. Fantastic. I hope you do. Yeah. And I hope you win. I hope I can stick a can you eventually. You will, dude. Yeah. We'll get on that shit. So, uh, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for doing this again. And uh, that's uh, episode three of the Danger Cast. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.